In this lesson, we're getting hands-on and looking at subnet design. We're going to take a fictional network company and assign IP space to each part of their topology based on their needs. Don't worry, I'll explain it step by step as we go through. This one is sure to be interesting. In this scenario, we work for an IT company. Our job is to do the subnet and VLAN design for a customer. Let's start with what we know. Our customer has a main office with 125 users. Each user has a PC and a phone. At the core of this network is a layer 3 switch. This handles some of the routing within the main office. There are a few layer 2 switches connected to the core switch. This is where devices like PCs, phones and printers connect. The main office also has an internet connection. Traffic to and from the internet passes through a firewall. The firewall connects to the core switch. Don't worry too much about how firewalls work yet, as we'll learn about them in a future video. Many of the services that these users access are cloud-based. That is, they're managed by another company and accessed over the internet. We'll look more at the cloud in a future video too. Besides the cloud services, there are five servers in the main office. These provide services like email and DHCP. Aside from the main office, there are two small retail offices. Each office has five users, each with a PC and a phone. At each office is a small router and switch. The routers have a connection back to the main office. There is a router at the main office whose only job is to connect to these sites. We call this the edge router as it's on the edge of the main office network. The edge router connects to the core switch. Our main goals here are to decide how many subnets we'll need and what they are, assign IP addresses to devices, choose which VLANs to use, and plan the routes that we need. I hope this doesn't seem too intimidating. If you can, I encourage you to pause the video and try to work through this scenario yourself. This will test out your fundamental networking knowledge, so feel free to go back to the videos in the fundamental series if you feel that you need to brush up. When you're done, resume the video and I'll walk you through my design solution. Okay, so how did you go? Did you come up with a solution? If you're ready, let's go on and I'll show you my design. First, I'd like to point out that there are a few ways we could approach this, so don't worry if your design is different. The important thing is to understand the principles behind it. I'm going to start with the main office. The first thing to do is create a list of VLANs and subnets that we'll need to support our devices. Based on what we know, we are going to need to consider workstations, phones and servers. We know there are five servers, 125 workstations and 125 phones. Remember each user has a workstation and a phone. What about printers? There's got to be a few printers on the network. No one told us about that in the original design requirements, did they? In the real world, this is where we would go back to our customer and ask a few more questions about their needs. In our scenario, let's assume that the customer told us that there are five printers. Let's put these in the workstations network, bringing the host count to 130. We also don't have any information about Wi-Fi. This is another case where we should go back to the customer and ask more questions. For now, let's assume that they don't need Wi-Fi today. But they may want to add it in future. Planning for the future like this will often make things easier on us later. So let's assume that each staff member has a phone or tablet that connects to Wi-Fi. There may even be a few other Wi-Fi devices. So let's say there could be up to 150 wireless devices. Okay. Now it's time to start assigning some subnets. The first thing I'm going to do is assign the 172.16.00.16 .16 network to the whole of the main office. Now on the surface that might seem a little weird. After all, that's one big network. But there is a reason for this. We're going to divide this big network up into smaller subnets. That makes this big slash 16 network a summary network. What I'm trying to achieve is this. Any subnet in the main office starts with 172.16. Why? Well, there are a few reasons I do this. 
One is to keep our subnets organized. This helps when we're troubleshooting issues. That includes looking at logs, pings, or trace routes. If we see an IP starting with 172.16, then we immediately know it's in our main office. Another reason for this is because it keeps our routing tables nice and simple, and I'll explain that part a bit later on. We have four networks that we need to plan for here. I'm going to assign a slash 24 network to each of them. Notice that they're all part of the larger 172.16.0.0 slash 16 network. Why do you think slash 24 networks are a good choice here? Once again, there's a few reasons. First, they're very easy to work with. They're easy to read, as the first three parts are the network ID, and the final one is the host ID. There's no fancy binary conversions you have to do in your head or on a calculator here. Additionally, each slash 24 network allows for up to 254 hosts. This more than covers our host count for each network, while still leaving room to grow. Not to mention that there may be devices that our customer has forgotten to tell us about. Yes, it does seem overkill in the case of the server network, but that's not a problem in a case like this, where we have plenty of addresses to spare. Keeping it simple is more important here. You'll also notice that there's room left between each subnet. Of course, that's not a rule, you don't have to do that, but making each network a multiple of five simplifies things here. Remember that we're not the only people who will work on this network, so we're trying to make it simple for everyone. The other advantage of that is scalability. Scalability means leaving room to grow. If our customer were to grow much more than we expected, then we can expand these subnets to slash 23s if we had to. So why don't we break the network up into smaller subnets? Why not use one big subnet for the entire site? That is, with all the Wi-Fi devices, all the workstations, the phones, the servers, all in one big network. And well, there's a few reasons for this too. It improves management later, as we can easily identify devices based on their IP address. We can apply different settings to each subnet if we want to. This might include prioritizing voice traffic, which we're going to discuss in later videos. Voice traffic, that is phones, should be on a separate VLAN. As we know, we should have one subnet per VLAN. And we can apply security between the subnets if we want to. That is, we can have ACLs or firewalls to restrict traffic between these networks. These may not all be things that we want to do straight away, but if we plan well now, we're in a good position to add these features in the future. Now to choose some VLAN IDs. We can use nearly any IDs we want, but here I have selected 5, 10, 15, and 20. So why have I done this? Just simply so it matches the subnet. This once again is just a little simpler and easier for us. That is, it's easy to remember that VLAN 5 goes with subnet 5. Of course, that's not a rule. I just find that easy to work with. We can now start assigning IP addresses to the devices. In the main office, the core switch is the default gateway for each network. We can pick any IP in the subnet for this, but I always pick something that's easy to remember. I usually use the first or last usable IP address in the subnet. In this case, let's use the first, which is dot one. The really important thing here is to be consistent. That is, use dot one in each subnet as the default gateway. This way you will always know the default gateway without having to refer to any documentation. The layer two switches, they don't need any IP addresses configured. Each server should have an IP address too. It doesn't really matter too much what we give them, so let's use dot .10 through to .14. We wouldn't configure static addresses for the workstations and phones though. That's far too much work. Instead, we'll want to use a DHCP server to assign IP addresses to these devices. For this, we know that one of our servers is a DHCP server. But if you think about how DHCP works, you'll remember that it uses broadcast messages. Can you see the problem that it might pose? As routers in layer three switches do not forward broadcast packets. So how then will DHCP requests from workstations and phones reach the server? After all, they're all on different subnets, aren't they? We achieve this by configuring the core switch as a DHCP helper. This is also known as DHCP relay. 
When a client sends a DHCP discover message, the call switch will see it, and then it will forward it on to the real DHCP server. The server then sends the switch its offer message, and the switch forwards it back to the client. When we configure a DHCP helper, we don't need to have a DHCP server in each subnet. We can follow the same basic process for our remote sites. As with the main office, we need subnets for workstations and voice. We'll also plan ahead and add Wi-Fi here too. There are only five users per site, so that's five workstations and five phones. Let's assume around 20 wireless devices for the Wi-Fi network. Being a retail outlet, there may be more point of sale terminals or other devices, so let's add these to the workstation count too. Now we've got that done, we can select a main network for each site. I'm going to use 172.17.00/16 for site A and 172.18.00/16 for site B. Now isn't that overkill once again for such a small site? Yeah, definitely. It is definitely overkill. But we have plenty of private IP space available to us and we're not using much for a small company like this. So even though it's overkill, it makes it easier on us. Anything starting with 17217 is site A. Anything starting with 172.18 is site B. So with a small amount of hosts, we could use very small subnets, but it's better if we match the main office. Yes, it's far more than we need, but using the same subnetting scheme at each site helps to keep things organized. I'm only showing site A in the table here, but I'm sure you get the idea. The same can apply to VLANs as well, the same scheme makes it easier on us later. But hang on, haven't I said a few times that we should only have one subnet per VLAN? Aren't we breaking the rules by reusing VLANs 5, 10 and 20 at the main office as well as at the two remote sites? That's true. Keep this in mind because I'm going to come back to that later. The switches at branch offices are layer 2 only. This means that the router has to be the default gateway. To achieve this, we configure a trunk link between the router and switch. The router is then in a router on a stick topology. As with the main office, the router has the dot one IP address assigned to each subnet. The workstations and phones use this as their default gateway. The phones and workstations get their IP addresses from DHCP. We have two options. One is to configure the local router as a DHCP server. The other is to configure it as a DHCP helper, just as we did in the main office. I prefer the DHCP helper option. I find it simpler in most cases to manage the DHCP scopes from one place. It also makes it easier for help desk staff to assist when needed, as most of them seem to have more server than networking training. The downside to this approach is if the remote officers lost their connection to the main office. In that case, clients wouldn't be able to renew or request new DHCP leases. Now we can take a look at the WAN links. These are network links that connect our remote sites to our main office. Usually service providers provide these links. We won't get too deep into WAN technologies in this video. You'll notice in the topology that each WAN link has only two devices, the router at the branch office and the router at the main office. We call these point-to-point -point links as they're simple links between two points. That is, they're very small networks with only two devices. This means that we can have very small subnets per link, knowing that we will only ever have two devices in each subnet. I've chosen 192.168.0.0/30 and 192.168.0.4/30. A slash 30 network is big enough for our four addresses. That's the two devices, a network IP, and a broadcast IP. Why not use a slash 24 network as we have before? Well, we could, and it would work just fine if we did. But there'll never be a need to grow the size of these links. Also, it's very common to use slash 30 subnets for point-to-point -point links, so anyone could look at your design, and they would probably have a good idea as to what's going on. You may also have noticed that I'm not using 172 subnets like I did for workstations, phones, and servers. 
This is to make the subnets stand out as being different. This is especially helpful when we want to use traceroute. Anytime we see a 192.168 address, we know it's one of these point-to-point -point links. Allocating IP addresses to each interface is easy on a small network like this. One trick I've learned is to consistently make the side closest to the core the odd IP and the other side the even IP. Now this isn't mandatory, but it can make it easier to read the trace routes later. One last important link to handle, and that's the link from the edge router to the core switch. This is also a point to point link, so I still recommend a slash 30 here. I've used 192.168.10 here to make it stand out as being slightly different to the WAN links. And using the same trick as before, I've made the core switch the odd IP and the edge router the even IP. Now for the internet connection. Here we have a firewall that's connected to both the core switch and the internet. To keep it simple, we can think of the firewall as a router with some advanced security features. We'll talk about those features in another video. Just like the WAN router, we add a small slash 30 subnet and IP addresses. As for the subnet between our firewall and the internet provider, well, that's given to us by the provider. We usually don't get much say in that. But for completeness, we'll document it here too. Let's say that our ISP gave us 203.0.113.128.30. The ISP has said that they will use .130, which leaves us to use .129. Also remember that private IP addresses that we've been using won't work on the internet. We can only use public addresses on the internet. So for this reason, we configure the firewall with NAT. Any traffic heading out to the internet will use the public IP of the firewall. If you would like a brush up on how NAT works, I recommend taking a look at the NAT video in the fundamental series. Now let's think about adding routing in. We won't do anything too fancy, just add static routes as we saw in the last video. The firewall seems like a good place to start. First, it will need a default route to the internet. This uses the ISP's router as the next hop. It also needs to send traffic back into our network, so we need routes for that too. We can simplify this by using summary addresses. All our subnets fall within these two summaries. That's an advantage of planning out your subnets. It simplifies the routing table. On the core, let's start with the default route. The next hop for this is the IP of the firewall. We also need to add routes for the remote sites. These use the IP of the edge router as the next hop. It's also good to add routes for the point to point links as well. This is especially useful when running trace route. Moving on to the WAN edge router, once again, we need a default route. This points towards the core switch. No doubt you've noticed that we need a default route in most cases. We also need routes to reach the remote sites. These use the IPs of the remote site routers as the next hop. The remote site routers will need a default route of course. The next hop is the WAN router in the main office. We don't need anything other than a default route here. Can you see why? The default route is essentially a catch-all route. It's a summary for all of our networks, and that suits us as there is only one way in or out of this network. This type of network is frequently called a stub network. Well, that's a lot of static routes that we need. It would be a pain to configure all of these manually, so in the next video, we'll start looking at dynamic routing to simplify our lives. Now before we finish, I have a promise to keep. I said I'd explain how we can reuse VLAN IDs for our workstations and phones. In previous videos, I've said that we should have only one subnet per VLAN. But here we have a few sites with several subnets and yet we're reusing the same VLAN IDs in some cases. Well our design uses a mix of layer 2 and layer 3. VLANs, as you'll recall, are layer 2, while subnets are layer 3. We've made the links between the main office and the branch offices routed links. 
By doing this, we've limited the layer 2 scope of each site. Think of each site as a layer 2 bubble. Layer 2 components are not extended beyond the border of the site. Any VLANs on one site, regardless of its ID, is completely separate from VLANs in any other site. In that way, we are able to reuse VLANs in other sites. Nice little trick, isn't it? As you build your skills in networking, you'll need to create designs and documentation. It's a required skill as you grow into more senior roles. So we're going to start here with a simple design document for the network we've just discussed. Patreon supporters can download the document from the site and use it as your own template at work if you want to. Now you've got those skills locked away, we can move on to dynamic routing protocols. We'll see a few examples and how they can make our lives easier.